أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, Welcome to this seminar organized by the Hujjat Academy on the end of life looking particularly on the Islamic medical and ethical perspective um, First of all, thank you very much for coming so I would like to welcome you all and thank you for coming on this Sunday when the final World Cup was being played. I would like to thank the Hujjat Academy for organizing it and for all the speakers uh, for coming and presenting to us and enlightening us with this very important topic. We would start the program with the recitation of the Quran and then that would be followed by me setting the scene followed by the two talks by the two speakers, then some time for the reflections from the audience, and then finally a le lecture by Dr. Um, Sheikh Shumali. So without any further ado, may I ask for the Quran recitation by Mustafa, please. Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم رجع البصر كورتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وحو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين واعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبأس المصير إذا ألقوا فيها سمعوا لها شحيقا وحي تفور تكاد تميز من الغيظ كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم نذير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير وقالوا لو كنا نسمع ونأقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فسحقا لأصحاب السعير إن الذين يخشون ربهم بالغيب لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير وأسروا قولكم أو اجحروا به إنه عليم بذات الصدور ألا يعلم من خلق وهو اللطيف الخبير آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم For those of you who don't know me, I am Dr. Intiaz Gulamali. I am a practicing GP working in Harrow in GP Direct, and I've also been involved in education side for more than 25 years, being, having been an associate dean, a program director, and currently a trainer and an examiner in the postgraduate GP training. 
The reason why we have gathered today is to discuss this very important and sensitive topic. And we are very fortunate that we have with us three very good speakers who are going to dwell on three different aspects of this topic. But rather than me telling you a theoretical side of why we are here, let me share with you a very personal experience as a GP. And this is one of many such cases. One day I was sitting in my surgery and a patient walks in who was in her 70s. She was being held by two of her daughters. She was extremely frail, very breathless and in agony because of pain. I had not seen this patient before, so she was a new patient for me. So I scrolled through the notes and I realized that she was one who had a bowel cancer, cancer of the gut, which had spread to liver and the lungs. She has had a number of chemotherapies, one failing after the other. And she comes in and sits in front of me, so I ask him, what would you like me to do today? And she said, please do something to relieve my symptoms, the pain and the breathlessness. I was not sure whether the patient really knew what was going on with him, with her. I wasn't sure whether the carers knew or the daughters knew what was going on. So I asked him, I said, what have you been told by this specialist so far? The answer was in negative. They said the consultant oncologist, that is a cancer specialist, have told us that I'll be having some more chemotherapy and that might help my symptoms and me. I asked them, have you been told anything about the prognosis? And she said no. Now with my very first experience with this patient and an encounter with this patient, and looking through the notes, there was a lady who was suffering was not responding to treatment and she was so frail that in my judgment probably she did not have more than a month to live and yet patients expectations had not been dealt with now it was a tricky situation I could not deal with such a case in 10 minutes so I said I'm going to give you something for your symptomatic relief but I think I need to see you more and give more time to you so I'll do a home visit. So I visited her. And she was happy to discuss everything in front of her children, her two daughters. So I had to give the bad news to the family, which doctors tend not to like. Some of us are very heroic and egocentric as well. <clears throat> this patient had not been told what the prognosis was. So in her mind, the expectations were that she would be fine and she will get better with the treatment. I liaised with the consultant. I told him and he accepted and he said, yes, I don't think this patient is going to get through the chemotherapy because giving further chemotherapy, we are doing more harm than good to the patient. Patient's wishes was that she wanted to die at home with her family and all she was requesting was, doctor, is, that's her exact words please don't make me suffer give me something for pain and the breathing and this is exactly what was done and the patient peacefully died within two weeks this was a success story to some extent if you can call it a success story but there are number of patients littered around in the hospitals where people are calling out ambulances in the last time when patients are getting death rattle. They are dying. We call it death rattle. And they land up in the trolleys on the a &E department. It is precisely for this reason that the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and the GMC have done the end of life guidelines for the doctors. So we respect patients as patients, treat them with dignity. 
and know the limitations and put them in the center of the management plans. Most of the principles upon which they base is in line with our Islamic ethical values. I'm not a sheikh, but we have got sheikh here. Who can throw more light on it? There is concordance with most of the principles. Of course, there are certain principles that we may not agree with. And the purpose today is to look at every aspect, to look at from patient's perspective, from carer's perspective, and from professional's perspective, as to what is and what is not allowed in our faith. It's a huge topic, and we roughly have two hours, and we have started the program late. So technically, we have less than two hours. So it's not humanly possible for us to cover everything, and there are certain topics relating to end of life which we are not going to deal with, and that includes organ donation. We need another seminar, Ari, for that, okay, on its own. We possibly cannot cover that. My request is, please ask questions pertinent to the topic being discussed so that we remain focused. What I want is really people coming out of these doors today with clear understanding of what is and what is not allowed. There will always be individual cases, and you have to look at case-by-case -case basis, but at least if we can understand and agree on certain principles, it will be an achievement. So how are we going to do that? We have three speakers today. We have Dr. Saida here, Dr. Saida is a GP in training, and she has graduated from the University of Leicester, and she has done a lot of work with the relief work in Calais and um, Bangladesh and Iraq. And she has also worked in hospices across the country, so she is very much familiar with palliative care. And she is going to discuss about DNRs, advanced wills, and things like that. We then have Professor Zedi. Professor Zedi, as it happens, was my principal and a professor and a dean in the medical college that I graduated from in Pakistan. So he's my ustad, actually. <laughs> you use the term Kadim, isn't it? You have used it yourself. <laughs> but then we are all Kadim anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, he's going to tell us about the normative ethics, the ethics, how does it originate, and the principles of ethics, etc. And then finally, we have Sheikh Shumali. Now, Sheikh Shumali probably doesn't need an introduction because I'm sure we all know her, him. Um, he was trained from the Islamic seminaries in Qum. He then did a master's in Western philosophy, I understand, from the University of Tehran. And correct me if I'm wrong, yeah? and then did a um, thesis and PhD uh, on um, ethical uh, relativism from the University of Manchester. And your postdoctorate was related to ethics in life and death issues, so which is very relevant. He is also the founding director of the Islamic International um, uh, University or thing in um, Qum, as well as is the director of the Islamic Center in Meadowell. He has also written many books on bioethics and ethics as well, and authored many other books as well. So we can't have a better uh, expert than him. So he is going to talk about the Islamic side, what is and what is not. Now, t this is all theory, but to relate it to the practice, what we will do is in the middle of the session, we will bring in three case histories. And we'll look at the case histories and then uh, try and apply those theoretical models to those cases so that people get an understanding. Otherwise, you know, it becomes just a theoretical exercise. So with having said that all, as I said, we are not going to deal with certain aspects of near-death thing, particularly organ donations or post-mortem. We are not going to tackle those things, okay? Because we haven't got the time. So without any further ado, may I pass it on to Dr. Saida, please. Thank you. Please welcome her with Nare Salwat. Assalamu alaikum. Can everyone? Is the voice okay? Yeah. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Kalamali, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Dr. Sayeda, um, and I'd like to start by thanking the Hujjat Academy for inviting me here today to speak about such um, an important and sensitive topic. Um, so very briefly, I'm a doctor, medical doctor based in London, in North London, completing my general practice training. Um, and I'm currently working in a hospice um, and have a special interest and experience within the field of palliative medicine and end-of-life care. So just to outline what I will be covering today, we'll spend a few minutes um, just discussing why end-of-life ethics is important. So why should we be talking about it today? We'll then go through some terminology and what is meant by a terminal illness, what is meant by end-of-life care, um, what is palliative care, what is a hospice, and also discuss some common misconceptions around some of these terms. Um, and after that, we'll go through and talk about advanced care planning, DNAR, so what a DNAR is, when it applies, um, when is it done, um, and then we'll end by talking a little bit about the differences between withholding treatment and withdrawing treatment. Now I know the audience is probably quite varied, so um, there might be some of you who don't sort of haven't heard any of these terms before, um, and it will all be quite new to you. Um, and there might be some medical professionals in the audience as well, um, and this might be quite basic for you. So please bear with me. Um, it's very important that sort of everyone understands the the basic sort of principles um, that I'm going to, you know, from the medical perspective that I'll talk about before we then go on later to discuss the Islamic perspective. Okay. So starting why, with sort of why this particular subject is so important. So the subject of end of life um, is something that we don't talk about. We don't discuss it, yet we know that death is certain and will come to all of us. So in chapter 3, verse 185 of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that every soul shall taste death, yet you know, why is it that we don't talk about death? We don't discuss it, we don't think about it. And in, you know, until in actual fact, you're put into that difficult situation where you might yourself be suffering from a, a difficult sort of a illness or disease, or your loved one is dying. It's only in that difficult situation that these issues are then sort of raised. And I see this all the time. So working within a hospice and working with patients who have a terminal illness, working with patients who are dying and working with family members. Another reason is, you know, why we need to discuss sort of end of life ethics is that people are living longer, aided by modern scientific technology and advances that have made it um, possible to live longer. And this has all happened in the last few decades. So 50 to 60 years ago, we didn't have the technological means to extend and prolong life like we do now. So if someone was very unwell, they would be given treatment and they would either respond to the treatment and become better, or they wouldn't respond and they would continue to deteriorate and that would lead to death. And we didn't have intensive care units, um, we didn't have resuscitation, um, and we didn't have all these machines to support and sustain life like we do now. So a lot of these ethical dilemmas didn't exist. So it is important for us to be aware of advancing technology and to be up to date um, and see what challenges this may bring to us as Muslims living here in the UK. And the last point of why it's so important is that in 2016, 46.9% of all deaths, so that's half of all deaths in England, occurred in a hospital setting. So again, we are more likely to face these ethical dilemmas and challenges. Um, so for me, I feel very passionate um, about this subject um, and feel it is incredibly important that we understand what kinds of challenges and ethical dilemmas one might face as a Muslim patient, a Muslim relative, and a Muslim doctor living here in the UK. Um, 
and I'll be sort of speaking about sort of the medical perspective um, of and what the sort of law of the land is here. And later we'll discuss um, later today the um, Islamic per perspective of what's permissible and not permissible will be discussed. Okay, so just moving on to um, some terminology. Um, so to start with, we'll just sort of t I'll tell you a little bit about the definition of a terminal illness. It's an illness that is not curable. Um, it's likely to progress and result in death regardless of, of the, any treatment. It usually refers to a progressive um, disease such as a cancer that may have spread around the body, um, end-stage heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and also neurological diseases like advanced dementia. And patients who have been diagnosed with a terminal illness, their life expectancy can vary depending on the underlying condition. So they may live with a terminal illness for days, for weeks, for months, and even years. Um, and their treatment and care is focused more on managing the um, symptoms um, and their condition rather than on cure. And I'll just sort of speak now a little bit about the terms palliative care, end of life care, and what is meant by a hospice. Um, so some of you may have heard these terms. And there are many misconceptions around these terms. So some people think that sort of palliative care um, and a hospice is only for patients who, only for people who are dying. Um, it, you know, they think it means that doctors have now given up on you if you're under the palliative care team. Um, you won't receive any further treatment. Um, so I just want to explain what each of these mean to try and sort of clear any misconceptions. So palliative care is for people living with, a, with an advanced and progressive illness where a cure is no longer possible, so a terminal illness. And it, it uses a multidisciplinary approach in which care is made up of various healthcare and non-healthcare professionals, aiming to provide holistic care and improve the quality of life for the patient and their family. And this is by helping them not only with their physical symptoms, but also addressing their spiritual, their social, um, and their psychological needs as well. And palliative care can take place in many different settings. So it's not just in a, in a hospice, it can be in a hospital, it can also be in your own home as well. And it, a part of palliative care includes caring for those who are near, nearing the end of life, and that is known as end of life care. So it aims to help people live as well as possible and to die with dignity. A hospice is just, um, like I said earlier, another setting for palliative care to be delivered. So some people, again, misconceptions think that um, a hospice is a very quiet and gloomy place, um, and that's, you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. Hospices, again, provide all kinds of um, holistic support for the patient and their family. And patients, again, can attend at any stage of their illness. It doesn't just have to be towards the end of their illness. Um, and a lot of patients, we find, attend sort of for the management of their physical symptoms. Um, so they might have pain or they might have breathing difficulties. They'll come in, th these symptoms will be controlled and managed, and there'll be sort of an average stay of 14 days, and they'll be discharged back home. So it's not that sort of patients are there just towards the end of life. It can be at any point. Um, so I hope sort of those terms are a bit more clearer. Okay, so now before we get into some of the specific issues um, outlined earlier in the in, in my summary, um, like DNAR and resuscitation, I just want to um, highlight what is expected of a doctor practicing here in the UK uh, when it comes to sort of ethical issues um, around end of life care. So I've got some sort of fundamental principles I just want to go through, which are pub which have recent which have been published by the General Medical Council. Um, and these fundamental principles assist um, clinicians with these difficult issues. Um, so I'll go through them, and later when we dis outline the actual ethical issues, we will sort of be coming back to some of these fundamental principles. So here in the UK, um, doctors need to adhere to the main principles of justice, truthfulness, beneficence, doing no harm, and autonomy. Doctors need to take all reasonable steps to prolong life um, 
where possible, but it is not an absolute obligation should the patient decline treatment. So here in the UK, a competent adult has the right to refuse treatment, you know, whether that leads to death, regardless of whether we agree with that decision or not. Every pa adult patient should, have pres should, have, should um, be presumed to have capacity to make decisions about their care and treatment unless proved otherwise. And lastly, if an adult patient lacks capacity, the decisions made on the patient's behalf must be based on whether treatment would be of overall benefit and what is in that patient's best interest. And this is done by the healthcare professionals speaking to relatives, um, or the patient might have appointed a lasting power of attorney to sort of speak on their behalf. So those are sort of the, the fundamental principles just to bear in mind for when we discuss the, come, next come on to discussing the issues. Is everything okay, sort of, everything makes sense so far? It's not sort of too much information? Okay. Okay, so just speeding up a little bit. Um, getting into the specific issues now, um, so that we can understand what may go on in practice in a hospital setting and why you may be faced with these issues. So the first is the concept of advanced care planning and a living will. Quite often now, when you might be admitted to hospital, you might be asked by the doctors, um, you, they might ask you or they might ask you on behalf of a loved one to clarify your wishes around your care and sort of the treatment that you want and aggressiveness of treatment. So how, how far do you want the treatment to go? Is there any particular treatment that you might not want? Um, and this is becoming a more common practice for doctors to ask in order to prepare and to be aware of patients' wishes. So common situations where this might occur is if someone comes in who has a terminal illness, so their illness is not curable, and there are reasonable, there's a, you know, a reasonable chance that that patient might die. Second group of people are those who might be asked if they are admitted to hospital with a serious or a life-threatening illness. So they might not have an underlying condition, um, but, but they've got sort of, they might have a severe infection like pneumonia, they might have had a heart attack, they might have had a stroke. And while many of these people will recover and get better, um, some will not. So again, doctors will try to elicit the patient's um, wishes ahead of time and what their preferences are in order to understand the limits of care. And the third situation is a patient who might be in hospital and is deteriorating. Again, they might be asked their wishes. Now, if we go back to the fundamental principles that I discussed earlier, expected of doctors, they cannot treat a patient with a treatment that they do not want. In other words, if you intentionally treat a patient with a treatment that they don't want, then the doctor can be held legally liable. So it's very important that doctors sort of know the patient's wishes beforehand. And these discussions on your sort of um, wishes in advance is known as advanced care planning. So you're making it clear to the healthcare profession what treatment you want or what you don't want in the future. And they don't just happen in a hospital setting, it can also be um, in the community. So if you're living with a chronic illness, your GP might have these discussions with you. Um, and again, this is in order to prepare if you were to become unwell and be sort of um, admitted to hospital. And it's much easier to have these discussions when the pressures are not so great. Because when you become unwell, the pressures are great, the stresses are great, and it's difficult to sort of in that moment be able to think about what, you know, you might not even be able to communicate in that instance. Many patients, when they become very unwell, they can't communicate. So it's important to have these discussions early on. Many of you sitting here in the audience, you might not have expressed sort of, you know, you might not have had these discussions with your family members. You might not have expressed your wishes. Um, and when sort of patients are admitted and we ask um, the relatives what would have the patient wanted in this particular instance, they, they, they say to us, we can't tell you because we never spoke about it. Um, so very important to, to have these um, discussions early on. Um, and we'll sort of be discussing later on from the Islamic perspective as to what is allowed sort of what you can have within your advanced care plan. Okay. 
The next thing I want to talk about um, and introduce is the concept of DNAR, um, or do not attempt resuscitation. Now again, something that many of you might have come across and heard of. Um, so I'll start by explaining what resuscitation is. So what is cardiopulmonary resuscitation? So CPR is the emergency treatment used to try to restart a person's heart when that person's heart or lungs might have stopped working. So when the heart and lungs stop working, this is called a cardiac arrest. And clinically, the patient has died. Um, now in this situation, resuscitation can be performed to try to restart the heart and the breathing. Now in, a, in real life, this is not a simple and easy procedure. In actual fact, it's quite a devastating situation and very difficult to see. And it can be very intense. So it includes sort of forcefully um, compressing and pushing on the chest and can include the use of a defibrillator and giving sort of electric shocks um, in order to restart the heart and also artificial um, inflating of the lungs to help the body get the oxygen that it needs. Now this procedure sometimes leads to, it can lead to broken ribs and it, all, it can also lead to patients being in a, in a far worse situation than they were before. Do not attempt resuscitation is a medical term which means that doctors who have seen that patient feel that it is not in the patient's best interest to be resuscitated. Um, and you know, they, there's, they, there's many different sort of reasons that this could be. So um, the patient, the, you know, there's many, it's usually a clinic, there's clinical reasons. Um, they feel that the resuscitation won't work, um, it might cause more harm and anguish to the patient and the family, um, and it's often because the patient might even be elderly or they have sort of an, an underlying terminal illness which is irreversible. So there's lots of different factors that contribute to when healthcare professionals make that decision. Now in the UK, um, Doctors will discuss decisions about CPR with patients, or if the patient is too unwell, then these discussions will be had with family members. However, the doctor in charge of the patient, of the patient's care, is responsible for making the final decision about CPR, um, and whether it is appropriate or not. Just a couple of important things to bear in mind is that DNAR does not mean that the patient will not be treated. It is only in the instance that the patient's heart and lungs were to stop. And also, if a DNAR is accepted or the patient is for full resuscitation, these are not permanent decisions. Again, these are things that are regularly reviewed um, and because circumstances can change, and so these decisions are not made permanently. So there are lots of ethical um, discussions around this topic, such as, you know, can a Muslim patient or can the Muslim patient's family accept DNAR? Can, um, a Mus is it permissible for a Muslim doctor to sign a DNAR? And inshallah, these will be some of the things that we sort of approach and talk about later on. And lastly, just moving on to, I know some of these um, concepts have been quite heavy, so I don't want to sort of last little bit left now. So moving on to um, another sort of challenge that we might face is what is meant by withholding and withdrawing of treatment and um, what is you know from the medical perspective so i'm going to just use an example um, of a case to just help you with this um, imagine a patient who is having extreme difficulty in breathing because of an illness um, and they cannot get enough oxygen into their lungs. Now the body needs, the body tissues need oxygen to sort of continue functioning and without the oxygen the tissues start to die and the organs can't function and this will lead to death. So the only treatment left is intubation and mechanical ventilation. So this is when a tube is put down the mouth into the throat and into the lungs and then attached to a ventilation machine to help you breathe. So the first issue for Muslim patients that they might face is that can they say no to a new treatment from starting? In other words, are you allowed to say no to, so this, you haven't been intubated, you're not attached to the ventilator, can you say no to that particular treatment? That is known as withholding of treatment. And the second issue is that let's say that the patient was very unwell, they were intubated, they, the mechanical ventilator was started, so they, the machine has already started now and it's helping them to breathe. 
as a Muslim patient, are we allowed to, to stop, say we don't want to have that, we want to withdraw it and we want it to stop? That is known as withdrawing of treatment. Um, and again, just sort of um, remember sort of coming back to the fundamental principles that here in the UK, Patients do have a right to refuse treatment, they have a right to the withholding and withdrawing. Um, but it's important for us to understand later on the Islamic perspective and what is permissible and not permissible. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I hope some of these key concepts have been highlighted and that you have a better understanding of the ethical issues and challenges that you might face here in the UK as a Muslim patient, as a Muslim relative and as a Muslim doctor. So I'll hand back over. I'm sorry I've sort of been a little bit over time, so I'll hand back over to um, Dr. Galamali. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saeed Hassan. Um, it was a huge task covering so many things within 20, 25 minutes. I think you've done a good job. Um, now, I'm sure you will have a lot of questions, but we'll leave the questions till the end, please, okay, so that we finish the first two presentations and then we'll come to the reflections from the floor. So now, um, Professor, it's your turn, if you don't mind coming and updating us on our ethical principles. Thank you. Um, just a request for the ladies, there are some places here, so uh, if you can just sit on this side, um, as there are not enough places then for the gents if they do come. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, please welcome the Prof, um, um, Professor Zedi, um, with a loud Nare Salwat, please. Oh. Uh, the slides, or can I speak? Um, the slides are there. Um, we will just come and put the slides on for you, okay? Assalamu alaikum. 20 minutes. I'm grateful to uh, Hujat Center and uh, uh, MTRs and all the participants for, uh, and Fahim and Sheikh Saab to have uh, given me the opportunity uh, to learn things from the masters. He's my teacher. We have discussions in the form of webinars and we have fantastic discussions. And I also see a wonderful young scholar sitting here, Ali Azam, who is very good in moral philosophy. I think we should invite him one day, Sheikh Saab, inshallah. Anyway, so could I, do we have the slides or can I just give a 10-15 minutes talk? Yeah? Okay. Oh, the slides, yeah? As long as you finish what you oh, I'll finish. When it, this is not mine. If you can just... Yes, I'll finish in seven and a half minutes if you want. <laughs> Ali Azam, why didn't you come in front? Because you are the main person of the store, Virtue Ethics. Thank you. So in front of two great scholars, Sheikh Shumali and Ali Azam, of course, many other doctors and experts, I feel I am, in fact, a humble student of ethics. And frankly, while the slides being said, let me just tell you that we didn't know about ethics at all when I was a student at Dharma Medical oh, College. Sorry. sorry. When I was a student at Dharma Medical College uh, in my previous life, and when I was a teacher for many long years before Imtiaz and Fahim and all the others joined, uh, there was no concept of teaching medical ethics. Medical ethics was introduced to me uh, through a patient. I'll just take 10 seconds. I used to do a lot of hair and neck cancer. So I was coming out of the wards in General Hospital. This man was a massive chondrosarcoma sitting. And every day I'd see him and say that, you have no fear of God, why can't you treat me? And I would say, look, look, it's not possible. We can only do so much. Anyway, so one day he told me that you are under obligation to treat me. I didn't know what were the rights of the patient or the obligations. So I started looking for it. I used to come to England, so I went to a certain place and learned. In those days, Iran was working very hard on developing projects on ethics. I was invited to give a talk in Shiraz. I couldn't go there, regrettably, but I started learning. So I started learning uh, medical ethics, and since that day, since that, uh, I think that episode was in 1985, I have been constantly learning. Not a day, go not a day goes by when I learn, uh, do not learn something new. 
So I'll just go through my uh, talk. It is a bit difficult because these are terminologies which even doctors sometimes find. I do apologize sincerely about it because ethics is not taught in medical schools. And for my learned audience, do forgive me if it is uh, slightly out of the normal. So I'll talk about, and Taz has uh, given me a talk, talk about, a task to talk about uh, normative principles of ethics. So um, the word ethics by itself is derived from ethos. That's a Greek, Greek word that all of us know. Uh, it means etiquette, morality, principles, values, disciplines, etc. Now that's the Western concept. In the East, adab, adab, akhlaq is a part of our culture. It is a part of teaching. Every majlis that you go to, you learn adab, adab and akhlaq. Akhlaq is the fundamental things of teachings of al -Ibad. So that is embedded in our culture. Now, Western uh, thoughts are that uh, ethics is a branch of philosophy. It is a child to mother philosophy, just like logic, metaphysics, aesthetics, politics, and some people want to include religion also. But I'm not sure we'll ask Sheikh because that probably will become theosophy rather than uh, philosophy. In medical ethics, or in ethics in general, but particularly in medical ethics, these three theories have been uh, very popular. Uh, first is virtue ethics, but I'll talk about it more because that's, more, that's close to my heart. Deontology, utilitarianism, and virtue ethics. These are terminologies. I'll try to explain them in very sh shortly. Deontology was presented by Immanuel Kant, who was a German philosopher, a very learned philosopher. It is based upon the concept of duties, rights, obligations and certain moral values and the intention is the means as well as the ends should both be good that philosophy that you do you do an act with the intention of doing good to the people utilitarianism is also called consequentialism that is certain acts may not appear to be good but if the results are good then you can justify and that's why it's called ends justify the means for example you get hold of a thief and beat him up or whatever, if you're saving the society, that's in large interest of the community and is accepted by some people. Uh, it was presented and promoted by these two philosophers mentioned here, Bentham and Miller. Virtue ethics is very close to my heart and Ali Azam and I, we have done a few lectures on Alibaba TV also on this and Ali Azam established a, a, a foundation called ethics, a virtue ethics foundation that you might be interested in, you can go on the web page. Plato was its founder, Aristotle promoted, it's a very ancient concept of virtue ethics but for some reason it fell into disrepute. But now it's coming back. And Alistair McIntyre, a great writer, you must read him if you have the opportunity to read, a great writer, um, he started this concept, they should bring it back. My favorite in medical ethics is Pellegrano. He's a specialist in medical ethics. He's recently passed away, I believe, but he has written immense amount of work on medical ethics, how to apply virtue ethics in medicine, and I'm currently engaged in writing a book on it. Uh, the cardinal rules of virtue, virtue ethics are very simple. Courage, compassion, phronesis, that's a Greek word, or perhaps Latin. It means practical wisdom and justice. Now, we'll talk about justice briefly. And when you apply these virtue ethical principles, you end up in eudaimonia, which the best I can translate is not happiness, it's not joy, it's not anything. I think itmanan qalb is the best word I can think of. It's Minani Qalb is the best translation I can give. And Ali and I have discussed sometimes that when Ali, Imam Ali alayhi salam's Fustubi Rabbi Kaaba, was it the state of eudaimonia? It's Minani Qalb. He was content with life, he achieved everything. But that's debatable, that's besides the point. Virtue ethics is, concentrates on character building, not on actions, not the ends or means, but building your character. So for example, you cross the road, you see a blind man and you help him cross. That's a good Samaritan act that anybody will do. But if you do it instinctively, repetitively, you feed the pe poor people, give zakat, all the, t the t things that we are taught in the Quran. Then that is called work. It becomes a built-in system in your character. So you don't have to think twice to do it. And that is what Islam concentrates on. The principles that Syed I just mentioned are principles of medical ethics are autonomy, khud mukhtari, 
and there's a whole philosophy behind it and in my, one of my books I've discussed it and under the concept of will and determinism jabro ikhtiyar that also comes into it but it means that you have a right to take a decision beneficence that you will bring good to the patient as a part of it. non maleficence is a part of benefit the corollary that you will bring good without causing harm that's important and justice again comes back it's the pillar of ethics islamic principles and sheikh will tell us more about it takrim bir and bir there's a lot of information on bir in the literature adl o ihsan and i'd like to mention here adl is root adl is we know adl justice ihsan is several steps higher adl is people gave away zakat alabad gave all the time. but ihsan is when they fasted janab sayyida and children fasted for three days to give away their food that is ihsan it's a higher grade much higher grade and that is why ihsan in quran and sheikh will tell us more about it is repeated with intensity azal is almost common but ihsan is very special sources of islamic ethics are quran in general i'm talking about general muslim population quran sunna ijma and qiyas jafri school is slightly different quran and al-bayt are fundamental sources but secondary sources are aql and ijtihad and ijtihad is a continuous process which we have and others do not i'll just go quickly through the slides practical examples of medical virtue ethics courage i mentioned to you very good example is serving in the war zones people go medicine san france is a good example imami and medics international goes out to these areas in syria syria and iraq and karbala that is a form of courage that uh, doctor show compassion is a part of medical profession a part of humanity in general but medical profession i'm concentrating basically for my colleagues and uh, that you have to use medicine and your art and sciences with compassion without compassion there is no ethics Furness says, "Apply the art of man." You said it very rightly, and Tal started with a wonderful talk by giving an example. You must know your limitations. Use practical wisdom, not theory alone. So, if you know that you cannot treat a patient, you must know your limitations. Refer to the right person, or like the futility of treatment. That uh, say, as I just meant, the therapeutic nihilism is not allowed. You should be very careful in what you're deciding. Justice. serving the sick based upon dictates of your conscience conscience is the non tangible form of justice and i'll talk about in a minute triangle of ethics when we come to that justice is a reward for individual merit aristotle called it the pillar of ethics there are different theories that i've mentioned here but the most popular currently is john rawls theory and i would encourage you all to read about it it's a fantastic theory it talks about a social contract equality that level playing fields able body with able body disabled with disabled and of course nhs was basically designed on the base principles of um, equity and distribution of resources to all who need it not on the basis who can pay it imam ali defined justice as orderly placement of your matters and that is justice its foundations of according to najul in najul balagha depth of understanding profoundness of knowledge fairness of judgment and clarity of mind each one is a lecture in its own right justice is of two types distribute the other types also but i'll just con- concentrate on two distributive justice and retributive justice distributive justice fair equitable appropriate and just distribution of services and resources these days a lot of talk going on about rationing and uh, limited resources and one day we should have a talk on that also if you have an opportunity retributive punishment should uh, should be compatible with crime it's not that if somebody has minor crime you beat him up to death like it has happened in islamic history without quoting in quote and quote john roll my favorite in terms of modern uh, theories of justice social con- social contracts based upon based upon liberty and equality and i'll just move on and it just as as i said was based practical applications i will not go into palliative into you got a beautiful definition that uh, the lady here has given of palliative care and uh, terminal illness uh, but i'll just br- briefly say that deontology you're obliged as doctors and physicians healthcare workers you're obliged to serve the patient to the best of your ability for fi- uh, keeping all the four principles in view but sometimes beneficence has to overtake autonomy like in the eastern culture if somebody walks in elderly person with cancer imtiaz sitting there 
lay, somebody in the family would say, that, say that, doctor, please don't tell our elder person, don't give the, break the bad news to this person because it collapsed. So Dr. Imtiaz Ulam Ali is within his rights to forego autonomy and take beneficence first. He said, look, all right, I'll talk to you first, but I'll talk to the patient after I've taken you into confidence. That is superseding beneficence over autonomy, and that is possible. Okay, I'll just move on. Uh, utilitarian, as I said, now unfortunately this theory was abused by Nazis during the Second World War when they said inferior people could be experimented upon to save the mankind. And that is why this theory is very, unpo it's been un very unpopular. It's being revived in animal experimentations because when you do experimentations on animals, you have to do animal experiments. This is the th theory which is used. And again, when you do animal ex experimentation, you must do with compassion. Compassion is an important thing. I'll just move on quickly. In palliative care and terminal illness, it should be part and parcel of physician's character. Character, I insist. Character, not duty, not moral obligation. It should be a part of your character to serve patients above and beyond the call of duty, instinctively, as a habit. Reasoning and consequences should matter little. The first and foremost act should be to provide a relief. Okay? Again, the topic, but that was the topic of the discussion. Always keep the principles of virtue ethics in your view, following the guiding rules that I mentioned before, autonomy, etc., etc. Do your best with courage, compassion, and practical wisdom. Know your limitations. Do not compromise on the voice of your conscience. Observe autonomy, beneficence, non maleficence, and justice as the parameters of your ethical values. Do not abuse your authority. It's very, very, doctors have a big problem of ego. I tell you, it's a big, big problem. You cannot tell it, oh, idea. I know more than you do. This is sad. I see it all the time. I've seen it in my career many times. Be humble. Humility is a virtue by its own. Know your limitations. And important thing, and say as I discussed it, and we'll discuss it later on, do not prolong the dying process. Because by causing agony to the dying person, you are just creating misery for the family and for everybody else. You have to be careful. Imam Hussain has a famous quote, death with dignity is but izzat. Urdu means it looks very nice. I'm sorry, Sheikh, this is in Urdu, but this is uh, dignity, uh, death with dignity is better than love. But in Urdu, it's beautiful. Izzat ki maut, zindagi ki zillat. No. Zindagi ki, zilla, uh, zind, zil, zindagi ki zillat se izzat ki maut behtar. It's a beautiful statement. Dignity, the word that you use. Dignity of life and dignity in death. So respect death as you, do, as you respect life. Sometimes death itself may be a blessing. I, have, I can't give you examples, there's no time. I've seen patients who literally beg, Doctor, please pray for us. Let us die. Cancers, head and neck cancer, which is my specialty. People really... You can't tell the stories, but some other time maybe. Human dignity, quality of life, very important. Independence to survive normally, and yaqeen in Allah Ta'ala. These are the important parameters. And this is my last slide. Triangle of ethics. Just if you, we can remember this, you'll remember a lot. Knowledge grants you power. Skills use, you, tells you how to apply that knowledge. So for example, you have the knowledge of atomic radiation, or radiation for example, and you have the skills to make an atomic bomb, you can make an atomic bomb. But if you apply the third principle, the conscience, if conscience determines whether you should apply knowledge and skills for the good or the evil, then that will determine whether you act as good or evil. Same knife that you use for cutting an apple, you can also use for cutting a throat. So conscience is the most important, and conscience is the non-tangible form of justice. So if you maintain just, justice in justice, equity and fair play, not equal distribution, justice is totally different. Justice which your voice, conscience, tells you, then you will not go wrong. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Zaidi. <clears throat> I'm sure we all are now experts in ethics. You have covered such a wide subject <clears throat> in 20 minutes. Well done. Okay, now it's time for reflections. Um, Arif, where's Arif? What I would like is now to put some three cases on there. 
and open up for reflections. What are your thoughts for the next 10 minutes or so from the audience? We are not taking questions as such, just reflections, okay? Because I can see that in the audience we have got many learned people, we have got sheikhs, we have got other doctors, and there may be people who may have experienced and would like to share their personal experiences as well. The purpose of this reflection is also, there is one other reason why we like to have reflection in the middle of the session, and that is just to ensure that we are not going tangent in a wrong direction, because it, it is very much possible you, you have certain expectations and we are going south. You want to go north and we are going towards the south, okay? So I think it can bring us to focus it a bit more. Um, I just want the cases, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> this is a bit uh, busy slide. Um, an 80 years old man with metastatic cancer, that is cancer that has spread, okay? It's spread to lungs, bones, and liver and continues to spread. Um, the condition is not responding to any treatment. Patient has been told by the specialist that he has less than six months to live. He has met with the palliative care team with regards to his symptom control. And he was asked by the team for his wishes and advised about DNR, which is do not resuscitate request. Can he agree for it? Can he make an advance will instructing others that he wishes to die at home? and does not wish to be taken to hospital for any active treatment. If we look at all these cases one by one after the Sheikh has delivered the lecture, but this is just for you to focus. The second case is that of a 70 years old with a stroke with very dense paralysis on the right side. He has expressed his wish because he has the capacity Capacity means a person can make a decision, okay? His wish in advanced will that in case of any further strokes and deterioration in his condition, he does not want number one DNR. He does not want antibiotics for life-threatening infections. Renal dialysis if his kidneys fail and does not wish to have clinically assisted nutrition and hydration. By the way, in the advanced will, basic nutrition and hygiene care is excluded. So a person can't say, I don't want to be cleaned, and I don't want to be fed orally. This is clinically assisted nutrition. We can look at this case as well and see what Islam says. That is assisted nutrition. <clears throat> 40 years, the question was, what about bag feeding? That is assisted nutrition. 40 years old, involved in a bad car accident with brain damage and multi-organ failure in intensive care unit for two months. Doctors have told the family that his condition is deteriorating and he has no chance of recovery. The consultant then speaks to the family and tells them, and this is a consultant telling them, not me, that now the treatment is futile and that they should stop all active treatments like ventilator, medications to keep his heart going, and assisted nutrition. They have asked the family to allow them to stop all the treatments and let the patient die as this is not in the best interest of patient or the best use of limited resources. What if there are two people, two beds in the ITU and four people needing them, and this is a very common scenario, should the priority be given to those most likely to benefit and what does Islamic ethics have to say in such a situation? 
Now, <laughs> I, we have given such a difficult task to our Sheikh Shomali here, but before I invite him to the podium, any reflections, any views, any opinions from the audience, please. But please keep it relevant to the topic being discussed. Yes. I was just wondering for children if there would be a different uh, route for them if they're um, approaching end of life as well. I think the same principles would uh, apply in my opinion, but Sheik can throw some light on it. Any further questions? Or oh, any reflections, sorry, not questions. I'm a retired RGN and I used to work with elderly care for about 15, 20 years in Birmingham and I felt at that time that the doctors had taken over the job of gods. They immediately wanted the patient to go on dimorphin syringe drivers and things like that so that the patient would die peacefully. Isn't that taking a, the job of a god rather than I would not put my mother was in hospital I would not put her under do not actively resuscitate. I took her home with TPN feeds and a catheter and I had two carers coming in to wash her and clean her and I would do it at night myself. And I waited till her time of death came. So yes. I personally would not do it because I think we are not gods. God only has the right to take life and give life. Yeah, that is true. Um, this is um, an ambiguity here because it depends upon whether you are doing it for the symptom control or not. Um, whilst I appreciate that um, you should not uh, do anything to shorten the life, symptom control is also important. Now, you have taken very good care of your mum, so the credit goes to you. But if I give you a scenario, for example, that if she was in pain all the time and not having the painkiller, then I'm not sure whether your good action, as Dr. Zedi has said, how does it balance against the other principles of ethics? And that is where the conscience and the wisdom comes into picture. But I'm sure what you did was with the good intention. Any other questions? Before I give the mic, please, can you just see on the screen, if it's your car, then we need the keys so we can remove them. Thank you. Yes. There was one somebody there. Yeah. Awesome. Salam alaikum. Look, sorry, I thought you were talking about reflection with respect to what you've written there. If no, not there. Um, let me tell you, this program is like a tasbih. Okay. Each element is linked to the other. So if people have come right from the start and going to stay till the end, they will get a tasbih, otherwise they will get danas. Okay, <coughs> so uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's a big request for people, please stay for the whole program because a lot of things will be covered in question and answers as well. It is all linked. And especially when the topic is so sensitive that's open to misinterpretation and ambiguity, it is even more important. But if you have any reflection, please do say. I don't know, because I'm talking about this particular one because you're saying about not feeding the person. So while you're feeding them at the beginning, you stop feeding them later on. So that would be starvation. <clears throat> no, I think what it says is, yeah, exactly. This is the whole reason for putting these three scenarios is because the outcomes may be different with all three. And I leave it for the Sheikh to enlighten us. I'm not a Sheikh, yeah, from an Islamic perspective. Arif, are we, um, yes. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Mohammed Baskaki. I'm a GP in North uh, West London uh, and I've worked in hospice and palliative care and um, geriatrics, uh, some experience. I wanted to just, I think there was a question about DNAR and I think it's important for us to clarify just what Dr. Sayedah had said. It's, it's quite important, this topic of DNAR. Um, what you said exactly about your mother is very true. When someone passes away, the concept is with DNAR is that when someone passes away, we don't attempt to bring them back from death. It's not a case of um, this form being something saying that we're going to let someone just die full stop. Once they've passed away, once 
they've actually died. The form DNAR is there to say that we're not going to undertake a process of trying to revive them from death by jumping on the chest, doing lots of resuscitation, starting lots of medication. And as Dr. Seth had mentioned about futility and a few different issues, the reason why that form was introduced is the default setting for all general practitioners, medical professionals in hospital is resuscitation. It means that unless I see that form in hospital, I will start this process. There's a couple of interesting cases that have come out recently about, uh, if anyone remembers Dr. Bauer, who has uh, been in the news massively regarding the resuscitation of a child. She misread, or there was a confusion surrounding the DNAR form, and she said this child has, not got, has got a form saying DNAR, we don't need to resuscitate. And exactly the case was that the resuscitation attempt to st for this child was stopped. Subsequently, um, the child passed away. A big investigation, she's been struck off. There's a lot of issues around that, but the point is that in hospital settings, everyone attempts to bring someone back from life, from death, by doing this attempt. As medical professionals, one of the things we think about is if someone has got for example, multi-organ failure, or we think that the likelihood of bringing them back from death is very difficult. Is it the most humane thing to try our best to do this, despite the fact that we know they've already died and it's going to be futile? And that's, that's the dis I think, a, a bit of the discussion from a medical sector. Excuse me, but I have seen doctors and I have worked with consultants. If the patient is for DNA, I don't they would just take the drug chart and cross off the drugs which are important to that woman's comfort in her last days. And that is the main reason why I took my mom home. Yeah, no, I, I, understand, I understand that. Without the syringe driver, without diamorphine. I was giving her her painkillers through her NG tube. But if she was in the hospital, she would have been put on the syringe driver and killed off completely. I'm, I'm, I would say that I'm very sorry to hear that. And I yes, think from... from Sure. No. Okay. No, no. I understand. Yeah. I understand okay, what you said. Fine. I, I think again, I've, just, I've requested, please, the reflection should be about the um, pertinent questions to the topic, and not to share personal experiences, please, to that much detail. No, That's a. Rec I, I know. I know. But things have changed since then as well. I don't know how long ago it was. How many years ago was it? Yeah, so it's a long time ago, okay? Things are changing and it's an evolving field. Cut, cut, okay, cut, any cut, more cut. questions, please? Any more reflections? Yeah, I just want to reflect that, that just one. Yeah, just to say that I'm, I'm, I think all of the medical professionals in the room who've heard that are very upset to hear that. That's not the norm at all. And I think from, from our understanding or my understanding as well, and I would, I would say that anyone who does have this form, we do tend to make sure that, as Dr. has mentioned, Dr. Zadie has alluded to, we do try to keep patients as comfortable as possible, look after their needs. I think, unfortunately, your situation, I think it's just, it's not good care. Um, and only apologize on behalf okay. of the NHS. All right. Right. Thank you. I'll just add 30 seconds to yours. It's a beautiful thing that you mentioned. A friend of mine, also a student, a professor of neurosciences in no less than Duke University, he told me himself that his father had Alzheimer's, he had a cardiac arrest, the son was present, people came over 911 in America. And they start, and they said, is there a form? DNR said, there's, there's no form. And they started pumping in the CPR, and he kept saying, look, he's got Alzheimer's, please let him go, for God's sake, we don't, et cetera. He said, no, we are obliged to do it. There was no form. Eventually, they did it, punctured his, um, uh, his ribs, developed pneumonia, and he passed away. And he told me particularly this episode that I should mention it, that one has to be, advanced directive is a good idea. Thank you. Okay, um, Sheikh wants to make a Just a minute, sorry. Uh, after him, you have to be okay. Uh, want to start a couple of Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful um, presentation. But what I am seeing now is a lot of grey area. Um, and I think uh, it is important to understand from the jurisprudent aspect uh, that is it black and white? 
or is it going to be as grey as, as we have seen so far? There are so many choices. Uh, and I think it is important that before we are steered to any kind of, uh, that we have this um, religious presentation by Sheikh, so that we then can make an informed choice. Um, but just a small question, how successful is DNAR? Do you have statistics? Um, yes. Um, do you have the statistics? I can give you the statistics. Yes, Depends. Yes, I mean CPR. Um, sorry, yeah, not it, DNR. I mean CPR. CPR. Okay. How, how successful? Okay. Is now it? the CPR success depends upon which study and statistics you are looking at. The statistics are different in states. They are different in UK, for example. According to, it also depends upon the chain of CPR because success rate depends upon how quickly the CPR starts. So, for example, if there's a bystander and, God forbid, someone has a cardiac arrest, and if a CPI is started there and then, and then the other thing that links to it is the use of a defibrillator, how quickly that is used as well, and the rhythm comes back. Provided there is no pre-existing conditions, often the success rate is quite good. Okay? In hospital setup, the success rate is around 40% if it is in a hospital. In the community, it's around 10 to 20 percent, depending upon what you look at. But then the surprising thing is, even in the hospital, after 40 percent that initially come back, if you look at how many actually left alive from the hospital, the number comes down to 10 percent. Now, there are no statistics that I could see where they were done, because ethically it will not be um, okay to do um, a CPR on a terminally ill patients. As Dr. Zadi has rightly mentioned, I think we need to bear in mind the examples and how traumatic it can be for not only the patient but the family and the nearbys. Because I have seen terminally ill patients not having an advanced directive, people jumping on, and you can actually hear the ribs cracking. And the patient is terminally ill, he's frail, he has no flesh, there's nothing there. So whilst I can take the point that we should prolong the life, we also have to respect the dignity of the patient as well. And therefore it's a balancing act. Now, I did read somewhere that if you try to do it in a terminally ill patient with a very poor prognosis, the success rate is not more than 1 to 2 percent. And that too may come back for a short period of time and then go. So there is a difference depending on what the statistics you look at. Okay, now we'll have a break for Tabaruk, time to eat um, and fill our stomachs up a bit because then we are going to look at these sort of issues but after the Sheikh's lecture. Now the ladies will go on to the uh, left side um, for the Tabaruk and the gents will remain here. And we'll see you back in 10 minutes time, please. Okay, exactly in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So ladies to the library, please, inside there, and the gents here. So and please, Asan. Um, and there's also, a, um, do you want to mention about the Inspiration Minds stall? Towards the, towards the end, please, there is a table which is from Inspirational Minds, one of the partners who have organized this event. There's very informative leaflets, so please do go there and have a discussion. I've read one of them, so please do take time. Ahsan.
this. So, brothers, if you can take your tabaruk, please go back to your seats, please. Slowly. And ladies, can you also please come back to your seats, please, Ahsan? Thank you. You can bring your tabaruk back, please, Ahsan. Brothers, please, can you have you take your seats, please? Asan. Salwat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, can you please take your seats so that we can resume the program? Brothers, please take your tea or whatever it is and come and take a seat. <clears throat> okay, we are starting the program again. Because we'll have a question and answer session as well before the Maghribain. So we have about 40 minutes for the Sheikh to deliver the talk on the Islamic ethics. So please welcome Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Shimali with a loud nare salwat. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al ladhi al adhim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina abil qasim al mustafa muhammad. Wa alihi al tayyibin al tahirin. La siyama baqiyatillah fi al aradhin. أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره. I am grateful to Allah سبحانه وتعالى for giving me the blessing of being here with you. And I pray that Allah would guide our discussion to the best of results, which may not be practically affecting our decisions because in the end of the day we have to follow our maraja but would help us to understand what's the rationale behind those decisions that our jurists and our mujtahids offer. To give you a little background about my involvement in this field of course, I had my studies in the Hose, and one of my major was Fiqh. But I also had interest in moral philosophy. And after doing my MA dissertation on 
after virtue by Alistair McIntyre that Professor Zaidi mentioned. Then for my PhD, I decided to work on ethical relativism. But towards end of my PhD, I came to the conclusion that my next work in the field of ethics should be bioethics. So I graduated in May 2000 and before graduation I started collecting information about Islamic approach to bioethics. I tried to collect what our ulama have offered. Even I went to comb and collected oral discussions of some of our ulama in their meetings. I tried to collect what our Sunni brothers and scholars have also discussed. And then I kept working on this and encouraging people to work on this. Alhamdulillah, when I went back to Iran in 2001, we managed to start degrees on ethics. We have now independent degrees on ethics, masters and PhD. And we had lots of dissertations and theses about this. One of our scholars uh, did a beautiful masters on gene ethics, which won prize. One person had his PhD on how to make clinic decisions about people who are in the brain death. So, alhamdulillah, now we have good collaboration between scholars in Qom and doctors in Iran. And also today, alhamdulillah, we see the same thing. We have very good collaboration. And all of us try to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. That's the main thing. So, inshallah, we all, with maximum sincerity and humility, try to understand what Allah wants from us. If we want to understand the core of Islamic bioethics and medical ethics, I think it would not be possible unless we truly and wholeheartedly believe in sanctity of life. And when I say life is sacred, it means nothing worldly can be mentioned as equivalent or as a price for life. So if you say to me, how much a human life is worth? One million, one billion, billion, one trillion? I say nothing from this world can be put as value for human life. Even other forms of life are sacred for us. Even animal life is sacred. Even plants and vegetables life are sacred. But when it comes to human life, it is so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرَ نَفْسٍ أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا. And this is not only said to us. Allah says this is what He has prescribed to Bani Israel and to previous nations also. Killing one person who has not done any mischief or has not committed any murder. So it's not a legitimate punishment. It's not legitimate qisas. Just out of lack of respect for human life. Killing one person is like killing all human beings. And we should not think this is for people who take guns and kill people. 
Man qatala nafsan can include people who commit abortion. Man qatala nafsan may apply to some doctors. Maybe apply to some scholars like me, if we are not careful about life. So, it is so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man qatala mu'minan muta'amadan fa jaza'uhu jahannam khalidan fiya. If one innocent person is killed, it is leading to eternal punishment. Why? Why we lose all the measures and skills when it comes here? Because there is nothing in dunya that can be comparable to human life. So what I try to do is to clarify this more. And I am very sad that unfortunately what we see today in the world is killing of many, many innocent people especially in the Muslim world. It seems that Muslim Ummah is thousands of miles away from this every day many, many innocent people are killed. But this does not mean that when we are dealing with a patient, we should underestimate this case because many people are killed by bombs or war. Every single person is absolutely unconditionally important for us. Yes, if we have limited resources, for example, if we don't stop connecting machine to this person, another person can die, that's another issue. But what I am saying is, nothing would limit our respect for human life. The only thing that can limit our care and not respect is if we need to care for another person. That's another issue. Again, our respect is there, it's absolute. Our respect for human life is there, but maybe now, as a doctor, I have two people, one person I cannot cure, another person I can cure, so I have to spend my time or my resources on the other one, but this does not mean that our respect has been reduced. So, what I would like to share with you is in Islam human life is very clearly defined in theory. But anything as application always becomes problematic. So it's not that we don't have clear definition of this, but how to apply it, it's another issue. For us, death is an experience that human beings go through. It's, I call it an experience. It's not end of life. It's not destruction of humanity. It's just an experience. Allah says so beautifully, Kullu nafsan dha'iqatul maut. You taste the death. It's not that is, de death is finishing us. We taste like we taste food. So, this is an experience. What is important is that our soul, as soon as it is created, here Muslim scholars have two different opinions. Some people say human soul or spirit is eternal. We are not created in time. But major view, especially among Muslim philosophers, is that we are created. Our soul is created. It's not that our soul is eternal and just comes and belongs to the body. So, whether you follow peripatetic philosophers or you follow transcendent philosophers like Mullah Sadra, the common idea is 
that the soul is created. Some say it is created from the beginning as an, immat as an immaterial reality. Some say it's a result of the substantial motion of the body. We don't want to discuss about that. But what is important is that human soul is going to be there forever. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Ma khulaqtum lil fana You are not created to perish. Khulaqtum lil baqa You are created to endure. Innama tunqaluna min darin ila dar You are just going to move from one home to another home. From a small home to a bigger home. So, when a person is given human life by creation of the soul, that person forever is going to be there. This is very important. We are not, because unfortunately, many people... Many doctors who are not faithful, who don't believe in, you know, divine religions, they think this person is going to finish soon. Why, you know, we need him to suffer? They are not aware that the reality of the person is the soul, and the soul is not going to finish, and the soul is full of understanding the way you treat the body would affect the soul. It's not that the person would not experience any pain when they are dying. Or even we believe after you die, the soul still is concerned about the body. You cannot burn the body. You cannot cause injury to body. Because first, there is a respect for humanity. And second, because there is attachment of that soul to that body. So, we are created to endure. Death is just a, a small experience. What is to be remembered is this period that our soul stays with body gives body also a kind of sacredness. This is my second point. So human life, which belongs to the soul, is sacred. But also body, which like the vehicle, which like a container, or like a cage, whatever you call it, for the soul becomes sacred. No one, even you, can harm your body. No one, even you, can damage your health. And no one can resist treatment. Whether you damage yourself or you refuse treatment, it means you have not valued the sanctity that human soul gives to human body. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way of prescribing our moral approach, Allah has given sanctity to human spirit and then from human spirit to human body. And I would like to share with you something that has always amazed me. A beautiful hadith from Imam Kazim alayhi salam. And when the first time I came across this hadith, I cried. Because I was philosophically trying to understand Islamic position with all humility 
But then this hadith confirmed my understanding. So it was a great relief for me. And I would like to share this hadith with you. This hadith is narrated by the late Shaykh Tusi, Rahmatullah Alayh, in Tahzibul Ahkam, one of our four major collections of hadith. Anil Hussain ibn Khalid qala sa'altu Abu al-Hasan alayhi salam. The narrator Hussain ibn Khalid said, I ask Imam Kazim alayhi salam, inna ruvina an Abi Abdullah alayhi salam hadithan uhibbu an asma'ahu mink. We have received a hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and I want to hear it from you. How careful they were. It's just one generation after Imam Sadiq and they want to check it with Imam Qasim. Unfortunately, we take things from everywhere and we don't check. So, Imam Ali Salam said, Wama huwa. What is that you have heard from my father? He says, Balagani annahu qal. Fi rajulin qata'a ra'sa rajulin mayyit. I heard that Imam Sadiq said about a person who cuts off the head of a dead person. In Islam, we are not concerned only about people who are alive. In Islam, we are concerned even about the dead bodies of human beings. And if we had this approach, today we shouldn't have these problems in the world. Qala, Qala Rasulullah. So he said, we heard that Imam Sadiq quoted from the Prophet. Inna Allah. This is a rule that we have also in fiqh. And based on this rule, our fuqaha say that even causing harm to a dead body can lead to dia. Inna Allah harrama min al-Muslim mayyatan ma harrama minhu hayya. Allah has prohibited to be done to a dead body whatever is prohibited to be done to a living body. You cannot say this body as long as belongs to a person who was alive is important after that just becomes a chemical or physical object. No. Even if this person has died an hour ago, few days ago, few weeks ago, we cannot do any harm to the body. فَمَنْ فَعَلَ بِمَيِّتٍ مَا يَكُونُ فِي ذَلِكَ اجْتِيَاهُ نَفْسِ الْحَيْ فَعَلَيْهِ الدِّيَةِ If this damage is a kind of damage that if this person was alive would have killed him. You should give dia. So this is the question he had for Imam Qasim alayhi salam. Whether Imam Sadiq this, said this or not. فَقَالَ الصَّدَقَ Abu Abdullah alayhi salam هَكَذَا قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Imam Qasim said yes. Imam Imam Qasim said, yes, Imam Sadiq said and narrated this from Rasulullah. Man qata'a ra'asa rajulin mayyitin aw shakka batnahu aw fa'ala bihi ma yakunu fi thalika al-fil ijtiyahu nafs al-hay fa'alayhi al-diyah. So, if someone removes the heart of a dead person, the issue of organ donation, other things we discuss if needed. Those are secondary things. For saving life, that's another issue. We can save someone's life, then that we may have permission with some conditions. But if there's no matter of saving another life, this life is so important that we cannot remove the heart of a dead person or anything that would have killed him. Of course, we cannot do any harm, but these are leading to dia. 
to a dia now the question is this this is the part that is very very important what's the dia for this person this is the part that made me very touched Imam Qasim alayhi salam said the dia for this is equal to the dia of aborting an embryo before the soul is created because you know embryo in different stages if it is aborted has different amount of dia when it reaches about 120 days almost the soul is created if just before that it is aborted the dia would be equal to the dia of causing such damage to the dead body what does it mean it means that life of human being depends on the soul and sanctity is because of the soul but soul can sanctify the body but the level of sanctity when the soul is with the body or not with the body is different when the soul is with the body we have maximum sanctity when it is not with the body still we have sanctity so just before creation of the soul and just after departure of the soul we have the same dear so this person was very happy then Imam alayhi salam said you don't want to complete your question he said I don't have any question Imam said no there is another question remaining to whom we should give dia in the case of embryo because still we don't have a human soul the dia is given to the parents and if one parent is guilty to the other one but in the case of a person who has died the dia would be spent spent for that person good things will be done on behalf of the dead person look at how much our fiqh is delicate and careful about every aspect so what i want to say is islam wants us to be as much as possible respectful to human life you know in islam the science of medicine is so much praised and recommended medical doctors are so much praised why because they try to serve human life they are very close to the people who try to serve human soul because we need both soul and body <laughs> there are two uh, sciences ilm al-adyan wa ilm al-abdan tib is for body and religion is for soul so maximum respect for human life now question is here what does this mean in the case of treatment what does it mean in the case of terminal illness what does it mean in the case of brain death we can discuss all these one by one but i want to give a common answer again everyone should refer to his or her own marja what we are trying to do is try to have a philosophical and fiqh discussion but this has no practical impact on anyone's duty just we try to understand the reasoning behind it we have to have maximum respect for human life 
anything that according to the common opinion of people who have respect for human life people who have respect for human life not just any person not just any professional not even just any muslim when we ask people who are concerned deeply about human life if they say doing this action is a requirement of respect for human life and not doing shows lack of respect then we must do it for example there is a treatment and this treatment is something which is affordable it's not that for example i have to go to a tr for a treatment but it means that myself my family my children for generations remain in debt <laughs> maybe here people would not say if you refuse to borrow millions of dollars for treatment that you have not had you know respect for life do you understand my point but it's a treatment which is affordable which does not have overweighing bad impacts if i refuse people would tell me you have had no respect enough respect for your life so i don't have right to refrain from such treatment but if a treatment is going to make my life or my life life of my children my family miserable i don't need or if i'm going for example to lose my honor and dignity because i have to beg people you know please you know give me money you know to treat this is different so we cannot talk about treatment whether it is permissible to refuse or not we say you must go for treatment as much as it is a requirement of having maximum respect for human life but if people who are very respectful to human life they say this is more than needed you don't need to do the heroic job you don't need to sacrifice everything just for this particular thing then you don't need to go for such treatment or we have to distinguish between preservation and prolonging life preservation is necessary because preservation is a requ direct requirement of respect for life what about prolonging it depends if i with little more efforts for example with good diet with some exercise with taking you know some vitamins with avoiding stress i can prolong my life i must do because i have to serve i don't want to i cannot say you know for me 50 years 60 years 70 years is enough but if prolonging life means i have to do extraordinary things i have to trouble people i have to uh, stretch the financial or medical resources which are available on a limited basis for everyone i don't need to go for such prolonging process connecting machine or disconnecting machine again the main thing is here if we know that this person or we think there is a chance that this person by connecting machine can be helped till we reach for example a solution a treatment or it's a requirement of showing respect to this person then we should connect the machine 
But if we know there is no solution, no treatment, and this person already has lived enough and has, you know, so much problem that no one, even the most respectful people to human life would say, this is a requirement of respect, then even connecting might not be needed. But if we have come to the conclusion that we have to connect, then to disconnect we need reason. So if your conclusion was that you have to connect, then for this connection, now you have to have a stronger reason to switch. So, my last point would be to refer to the view of some of our <coughs> maraja, and I will finish soon, inshallah, to see that there is a very vibrant discussion going on in our houses, among our fuqaha, among our maraja, and it's not that they are not aware of these discussions, but we need to be respectful to the scholarly view of fuqaha. We need to wait till either they reach consensus or we you know, for example, accept the reasoning. Till we reach that level of agreement, we can keep all our discussions, but practically we have to follow the fatwa. We can not, even, you know, I, if I am, for example, the top expert on bioethics, on top of that, I am the top doctor, and I am professor of medicine and ethics and philosophy and everything. When it comes to fiqh, I just follow the fatwa. The marja himself also has to follow the fatwa. Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi was asked about brain death. And of course, there are several uh, replies that he has about this question. But one of them, which is very detailed, I want to translate for you. It's as a sample. And then, inshallah, I will refer to what Ayatollah uh, Sistani says. And these are not the only ones that are available, but I only mentioned two because somehow they are different. So you can see the diversity and appreciate that there is dynamism. So he says, the people who are in the con condition of brain death and the doctors have said there is no way for them to be able to gain their normal life. So, he says these people are not considered completely dead and at the same time, they are not completely alive. What does it mean? It means that in legal discussion, sometimes we are not able to follow what happens in reality 100% clearly. We have areas that we have to be very precautious. You know, like for example, sometimes, you know, you don't know whether it has become Maghreb to break our fast or not. We know the definition of Maghreb, but we don't know what has happened. It's cloud. We cannot see whether it's Maghreb or not. So what should we do? We should keep fasting till we are sure that it is Maghreb. And we should delay our Maghreb prayer till we are sure. So, he says, for such people, we don't apply the rulings of Masa Mayyat. So, if someone is in brain death, we don't say, if you touch the body, you have to do ghusl for Masa Mayyat, touching the Mayyat. Ghusl Mayyat, Salatul Mayyat, Kafn, Daf would not be done. Unless the heart stops beating, 
the body is cold means we are hundred percent sure that this life without our interference has finished you know so we even wait the body becomes cold because we don't want to rush it's not that as soon as sun, uh, heart stops beating we say okay let's finish it once i mentioned this joke uh, about people who don't make distinction between something that we know would end and something which has already ended. Because some people say, we know this person is going to die. There is no chance of reverse. I say, it's not enough. He should have died. Plus, there should be a little also waiting period so that he would not come back or people don't think that we have rushed. You know, like Salat, when your Salat is finished, it's not good you jump and go away. Sit a little bit, do some ta'qibat. This is respect. When the guest is not, uh, for example, staying and leaving, go with him to the door, a little bit outside the door. Not just he says, I'm going to say goodbye. So this is the story about 1979, just before revolution. There was martial law in Tehran. And people were supposed not to be outside in Tehran after 10 p.m. Maybe this is a joke. I don't know if it's real or not. So, a soldier stopped someone about 15 minutes to 10. And then, when that person started walking, he sh shoot at him. So the officer asked him, still we have 15 minutes. Why you shoot at him? He said he told me he's going to Maidan Shush, southern Tehran. There is no way in 15 minutes he can get there. I am sure he would not be there in time. So this is the logic of people who say, because we know something is going to end, there is no chance of this person continuing, we can uh, speed up. No. Not only we wait till it becomes 10 o'clock, we even wait few minutes after that to make sure that our clocks are going, <laughs> working okay. That person's clock is working okay. And people don't think we have rushed. So, he says, we don't apply those rulings till the, hearts, the heart stops beating, the body becomes cold. But, this person, if has made someone vakil, you know, he had an agent, authorizer, that is no longer valid. So, from this perspective, we consider this person as a person that is not able to function as an ordinary person. But when it comes to his life, we are still respectful. Or for example, this person cannot authorize anything. We don't accept even, for example, if someone you know, takes his, I don't know, fingerprint or whatever. But at the end, he says, this is when it is proved. By the way, one thing that also he says, he says that uh, in such condition, according to him, not all Maraja, you can take some of his organs, because some don't allow, but he says you can take some of his organs to save another person. Ayatollah Sistani Hafadahullah So he says we don't recognize brain death as death. And he says this person has to uh, be preserved till his heart stops beating. And he says 
there is no permission even for this person himself if he has signed something in the past to take his organs that would damage him so our ulama are not disagreeing with medical doctors this is my last point it's not a matter of disagreeing with science with experience with evidence no it's a matter of having two definitions of death first and second a matter of how much respect we want to have for human life so even if we know this person is certainly not able to gain back his consciousness this person has no way to remain for few more days in this for example condition but we have to show maximum respect and let that life peacefully without our interference ends in the way that leaves no doubt for anyone you know look at the psychological side of it maybe you are sure that this person is dead but if there are people in the society that think we have not been careful we have not been respectful we have not waited enough for this person peacefully depart from this dunya this would not be accepted so we have to continue these discussions fiqhi discussion philosophical discussion medical discussion there is no contradiction between them each of them has its own concern but in the end of the day what we are expected to do is to do what fiqh tells us because this is to define our practical response maybe as a medical doctor or maybe as an rf you are sure someone has died i mentioned one story for you when sayyid ahmad khomeini the son of imam khomeini rahmatullah alai you know for some time he was in the condition of like brain death or something similar to that in hospital and people used to pray for him the family of imam sent someone to mashhad to ask an arif mr mujtahidi an arif in mashhad to pray to do something and this person went to mashhad in the hotel and was thinking how i can find him then a person came to the lobby of hotel and asked for him and said mr mujtahidi has sent me and he has a message for you that barzakhi life of sayyid ahmed khomeini has started means according to that mystical vision he is already dead he has already started his barzakh but we cannot stop respecting this body in hospital because we don't have that vision we need something legal that everyone can agree and understand when we say for example the soul yes uh, the soul is born after 120 days can you say wallah every human in burial soul in 120 days reach that point no we cannot say that but we need to fix you know we say when you are in motorway don't drive more than 70 miles we have to fix someone says i am a you know racer car racer i can drive you know 100 miles and i am safer than you say sorry in law we have to fix for average people so this is the fiqhi approach we fix we have red line clearly to understand common sense or can appreciate that this person is fully dead 
and then after that we apply the rulings that belong to uh, dead people. Thank you very much for your attention. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Um, Sheikh, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Um, <clears throat> you made us all think. <laughs> okay, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, please. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much to all the speakers for your excellent presentations and for the opportunity to discuss this very important uh, subject which is close to all of us. Um, Sheikhna, I just wanted to ask you if you could give us an opinion on do not actively resuscitate and how that actually applies to all of us in the decisions that we need to make. So, for example, God forbid, but if I should suddenly collapse here, I would want every single doctor in the room to jump on top of me to give me CPR and get the muki to bring out the defibrillator to try and bring me back to my life and inshallah if they have that 10% of success then at least they've done what the Hippocratic Oath tells them to do and when we're in a position to have at least attempted to save or act within the confines of Islam and protect the sanctity of my life but then if we fast forward to a situation uh, which Dr. Saidi mentioned about uh, a friend who had advanced Alzheimer's the chance of a successful outcome of that resuscitation after perhaps the Islamic definition of death which is the heart has stopped has happened um, would we want to treat do not actively resuscitate in the same way probably not but is there an Islamic perspective on what should happen It seems that if that person has already gone to the condition of brain death, then we don't need according to some marad. And according to some, we need. But before that, it seems we need. Even if there is a chance of this person may be able to gain his life and continue even if the chance is little it's not one in for example you know million which is not considerable but even if it is 10 percent even it's five percent i think we should do so maybe we end up with reviving him or we end up with breaking for example his ribs okay but Every, I think, person when weighs these two sides says it's better if we risk because maybe we can revive him. But again, every person should check with their, you know, marja. But I think based on the grounds and mabani that we have, this would be a fair conclusion. But if it is brain death and you follow someone like Ayatollah Makarem, of course, you don't need to go for any treatment or any machine or what? Yes. Yeah, so I said before that, I don't see why we should not try it. I don't see why we should not. Yes. All right. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank Alaykum. you very much for your, your talk. It was very insightful. Um, I hope you'll forgive me. I can't stop myself from thinking about some contradictions that you made during your talk um, mainly to do with if life is so sacred then why is passing over just the soul continuing why is death such a big deal if death is just just like eating a meal um, it's just like tasting a meal sorry um, why is life so important why is life so sacred if the soul is moving on just like I suppose Yoda says, um, don't fear death. Yes, very good. 
you know, if you cook, there is a time that you can taste the food. Before that, you shouldn't taste the food. <laughs> it tastes terrible. <laughs> so, basically, every moment of life is valuable. Even a person who is suffering, we think, okay, this person is suffering. But you don't know when he is suffering, he is in the most productive mode. When I am functioning, I don't gain for my akhirah as much as I gain when I am suffering. So we should not deprive this person from even short period of his life, even few hours of his life. This is different from someone who has died or, you know, uh, we do something extraordinary just to artificially prolong. I'm not talking about that. But we don't have right to do anything which would be hastening the death of people just because death for us. Yes, death for us is something simple, but every moment of life is important. And we have to appreciate that. And that suffering person, that person who is in pain, and we are all very sad, but we should not underestimate their life. Who am I to say, this life is not worth living? This life is worth living even maybe more than my life that I am healthy. So, there is no contradiction. Thank you, Sheikh. Yeah. There's another question. Um, I'll ask this question to all of you because I think it relates to all of you. But the discussions that doctors have with the relatives and with the patient about the NAR and whether to um, put it in place often depends on what they feel the quality of the patient's life will be. Yeah. Now, if the Islamic perspective is that whatever the quality of that life, it is dictated by Allah and it's not in our hands, then do we have the option to take DNAR as active, if that makes sense? Are you asking about the professionals? Yes. How do we so, balance the Islamic <coughs> view with the medical view and the ethical view? Because we are, uh, Sheikh, what I think uh, you are alluding to, and this is very important, because we are, as Dr. Saida has said, we are bound by the GMC, which is a statutory body. and. Of course, there is an autonomy there as well in that for the patient. Now, we may not agree with that for Muslim patients, but if a non-Muslim patient then says, this is my right, this is what I want to do, and it's a terminal illness, and if you ask any body of opinion, and you yourself have mentioned that whilst the life, is, the life sanctity is not in question, we all have to value the sanctity of life, you have mentioned of people who really value the sanctity of life, if they feel that doing this action or whatever is actually against the dignity of the human body or human life, then it's better not to do. So there comes a stage before the CPR is signed that the body of opinion from the professionals feel in line with what the patients feel, that is not the case. Now, First, there is a law whether the patient as a Muslim patient can do that or not. But then what about the professionals? There are thousands of Muslim doctors bound by the law, the law of the land. And if we are in breach of it, we can be taken to GMC. Now, there is a consciousness clue to some extent in some cases, which I'm aware of, like for example, for abortions, we can declare that. But those are in extreme cases, like for example, I know that people can do so for ventilator, switching of the ventilator and that sort of thing. But for do not resuscitate, which I'm talking about CPR in particular, I'm not sure whether that would apply to that or not. Yeah. I think uh, this is a slightly different from your question, yeah? But, yeah. yeah you know, what uh, I hope uh, we can keep it clear for us is that when Islamically we talk about quality of life, we don't mean that a person should be walking and watching TV. So say, okay, he, he has quality life, but if he's on bed and cannot, you know, move, you know, he has no quality life. As long as 
a person has a human life, this is quality life. Okay, it doesn't need to be healthy. So, if there is something that we can do to preserve and we don't do, we are responsible. But we can, if we can, there is nothing that we can do to preserve. We are trying artificially to just for few more, for example, I don't know, days or hours, keep this person functioning, the body is functioning, but all people who have maximum respect would say, this person is not you know living you are pressurizing too much yourself and you know the patient and the relative whatever so what I want to say it's very much here an area that we need public opinion of people who are like-minded and over time this may change maybe 50 years ago because it was not medicine was not that advanced we could more easily to say we have done enough. Nowadays, it's more difficult to say we have done enough. So it's something that can change over time. But what is important is according to the Orf of Mu'minin, we should say that we did whatever we could. Thank but you. not by going to, you know, for example, you know, uh, extraordinary you know measures and you know um, cause you know things that no one would accept okay thank you Excellent. I've got five minutes and there are two three people who want to ask the questions three questions one yeah. two and for and your question also yeah thank you assalamu alaikum um, my question is uh, is a little bit uh, it's not complicated but after hearing what you've spoken about, um, there are so many different scenarios for end of life. Yes. Um, you know, you have, we've had people in our family where everything has shut down. Organs, sepsis has come in, there's no chance, uh, you know. And then you have situations where someone has been in a terrible accident and they're on a life support machine. Um, what you said about respect of life, and as an individual who practices, who has a marja, but also has reflection and has self-determination. And sometimes, as we know in law, fiqh is there, but there are always loopholes. And sometimes you don't find the loopholes that you need, or sometimes the questions that you have are not there, the answer isn't there, unless you physically call up your marja or email him and get, a, get an answer. So what I'm trying to ask you is that if after what you've said and after looking at your marjas and after speaking to your doctors, to professionals, people who are surrounded by this every day, does your sense of common sense, is that, can that be applicable or for example, if you, don't, you aren't given a choice, in some situations you're at a hospital, it's not private, you're not paying, you are not given a choice. They will tell you, I'm sorry, they are brain dead, we cannot ethically and morally continue this form of treatment and we must remove the ventilation. Thank you. I just want to know what... Thank you. Uh, can we ask the other question and then you can answer whatever time is left, um, Chef? Thank you. Uh, Sheikh, thank you very much for the definition of uh, respect of life, um, which uh, you, in your uh, lecture, uh, referred to as the principle of understanding whether to preserve or prolong life. Uh, and in that you give an example of the financial um, misery that it may cause any kind of uh, attempts to, to carry on with life. Uh, I just wanted to bring your attention to whether you could um, confirm uh, that apart from the monetary aspect, uh, there are two things that come in the medical field as described by Dr. Sayeda and Dr. Mtiaz here. Uh, one is the pain and suffering, which you answered uh, the brother here, that that is not a criterion to, to determine whether life should continue or not. But the other thing is the indignity of the disability of the person. 
when a person is in such a vegetative state where the person cannot care for oneself where the person cannot clean oneself and has to rely on people to do that and our fun uh, we would be looking at uh, the, the, this kind of that look for respect perhaps the person has some self esteem okay. uh, and, and therefore uh, prolonging life is not adding to the esteem of the person so i don't know whether that can be taken into consideration so okay. um, i don't think we have good time for the third question so shek do you yes. want to answer thank you very much regarding a question by sister if uh, you have no choice the hospital does not listen to you then you don't need to fight with them you know <laughs> but if you have the choice so either you follow marja or you have to prepare your answer before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if marja says something okay i say it's my marja said but otherwise if you are sure that you can answer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and undertake the responsibility then you can you know do that but till you are not 100% sure that you have answer you have to do ihtiyat this is uh, i think what we do everywhere but if you have no choice doctor hospital they say by law we cannot do any more we don't need to fight with them we have done what we could you know and we try we ask we insist but uh, you know we cannot you know start you know fighting you know okay regarding your question you know we have to keep respecting life unless it is proved 100% that there is no need because if we go to that avenue it is a slippery you know it's like for example what about children who are born without uh, you know rational capacity why you know we should keep them alive okay you know there are many you know children all their life they have to be in special hospitals for you know people who have no understanding we say because humanity is so important and human life is so sacred that even the margins have to be respected because if we allow exceptions and say this person cannot control for example uh, himself this person does not understand this person is you know in pain this person is going to die anyway if we allow these exceptions then little by little then they would say this person is not productive anymore this person is just you know staying on for example pension so little by little only they keep few people and then they get rid of the rest we have to make sure that we don't allow for such thing Okay thank you very much um sorry we have the namaz time is coming i would like to end this by thanking you all for coming for thanking the sheikh professor zaidi and dr saida for uh, giving us the presentations and for uh, the hujjat academy for organizing it and my special thanks to arif ali hirji for working so hard in doing this and bringing it to fruition many questions have not been answered it's a very big topic this is first of our series i'm sure we need more time to discuss this more in detail what i have learned from this is that life is sacred as far as islam is concerned you have to look at things on an individual basis and i think within the beneficence there may be a scope for individual decisions but we need to refer to our individual marajes and with that note and with a note of thank may i end this with a loud nare salawat please <laughs>